Good morning and welcome to church. I'm Jack Holvey, Associate Minister of Discipleship here at Turner Christian Church, and I'd like to just go through our announcements together this morning. First and foremost, please make sure to fill out your connection cards. If you're here in person, those should be in your bulletin, and you can drop those off in the bins at the back of the room as you leave today. If you're online, please check the link in the description below this video to fill out your connection card. Now for the announcements. A pantry pounding for Rachel White happened this morning, and there will be a brief dedication after the service today. So if you'd like to join us in dedicating these items to Rachel, as well as eating some cake, uh, join us in the fellowship hall directly after the service. The church board voted to approve the amendments to the bylaws, and so there will be a congregational meeting happening on September 12th to vote to approve the amendments to the bylaws. If you're looking for more information on these amendments of the bylaws, you can find copies of them in the foyer today. And there will be a town hall meeting happening on August 25th at 6.30 p.m. to discuss these amendments of the bylaws, as well as answer any questions that you might have. Our next announcement is that there's a Deacon's Work Day happening this Saturday, August 21st, from 8 a.m. to 12 noon. We're doing a lot of similar stuff that we've been doing and just cleaning up the grounds and making sure this is a wonderful place to do ministry. Also happening on that day, August 21st, is our spring cleaning event, starting at 9 a.m. We will be focusing on the inside of the building and the classrooms to make sure we're ready for the fall. So if you can join us for either of those two events and help us out with that, we'd really appreciate that and we'd love to see you there. A deaconess meeting is happening next Sunday, August 22nd, directly after the church service. And so if you're a deaconess, we'd appreciate your attendance to that. Our final announcement is that we have a family fair coming up on August 29th from 5.30 to 7 p.m. This is going to be a really fun event for the whole family. There will be food, games, and snacks, and other fun stuff, and we invite you all to be there. This is really for church members as well as those who are just curious about the church and who we are and what we do here at Turner Christian Church. So there will be more information about just what we do as Turner Christian Church, and so we invite you to that. If you're looking for more information on some of these announcements or any other announcements that we didn't cover in this video, we invite you to look at those in your bulletin. I'm so excited that you're here, and I pray that you enjoy service this morning. Before uh, we gather in worship, we have one more announcement to celebrate. Uh, tomorrow is a special day for a couple of people in our, in our midst today. Um, the Macaws are seated right over here. Can you raise your hand? Are celebrating their 64th anniversary tomorrow. Congratulations. Congratulations. Welcome, church. It's good to see all of you. I'd invite you to stand if you are able for our call to worship. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm chapter 147. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise Him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble, but casts the wicked to the ground. So sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God on the harp. Would you join us as we worship this morning? Thank you. 
It wasn't muted, it was turned off. <laughs> Just not even on. Now is the time that we set aside for confession. When we uh, tell God exactly uh, who we are, exactly when we recognize um, what we've done, the ways that we have not um, been righteous, the things that we have done wrong, and we ask Him to forgive us. It's also the time when we uh, see the things that God is doing in us and the ways He has helped us to be better, and we thank Him for that. So please take a moment to reflect over where you're at with God, anything you need to bring to Him, and then we will pray a prayer together. Let's take some time. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Dear Father, we admit that we have sinned. We have disobeyed you and hurt each other. We are truly sorry. Please forgive us and help us obey you, love you, and love our neighbor. Amen. We confess because Scripture gives us this confidence. God is faithful and reliable. If we confess our sins, He forgives them and cleanses us from everything we've done wrong. Do you believe this? Then we can share that forgiveness with each other. So please take a moment to say to those around you so that everyone receives this word. Jesus says to you, your sins are forgiven. And now as God's forgiven and reconciled people, let us greet each other as brothers and sisters. Good morning. Let's repeat our confession of Christ together this morning. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, who is my Lord and Savior. In the book of Ephesians, Paul wrote a series of prayers for the church. He asked God to help, re- help, to help them remember, understand, and how blessed they've been who, by who Jesus is. This morning, I'd like to share just a portion of Paul's prayers from the first and the third chapters as we, before we take communion together as a congregation. This is what Paul says. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the wonderful future he has promised to those who call. I want you to realize what a rich and glorious inheritance he has given to his people. I pray that you will begin to understand the incredible greatness of His power for us who believe Him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. I pray that from this glorious, unlimited, from His glorious, unlimited resources, He will give you mighty inner strength through His Holy Spirit. And I pray that Christ. 
and I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts as you trust in Him. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how deep, and, and how deep and high His love really is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is so great, you will never fully understand it. Then you will be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now glory be to God. By His mighty power at work within us, He is able to accomplish infinitely more than we would ever dare or ask or hope. May He be given glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever through endless ages. Amen. With that, let us take communion together and remember, understand, and be blessed by who Jesus Christ is. I invite you to stand again if you are able for our communion.
A neighbor of ours dropped a jar of wet, rotting pumpkin seeds in a front yard last year, right in the corner of a split rail fence that runs across her front yard. Well, evidently, one seed wasn't too rotten or too wet. And a vine began to grow this past spring that is now about 25 feet long. The leaves are big and beautiful and uh, just just make the fence look even better than what it had before, and there are even some pumpkins that are growing on the vine. Well, another neighbor's grandson inspects the vine with great anticipation whenever he visits now because he was promised one of those pumpkins for Halloween. It's truly amazing to see what God and a seed can do. It really is. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 9, he says, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but also is overflowing in many expressions of thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but, yeah, I'll say three times, just for emphasis. It's truly amazing what God and the seed of generosity can do. It produces a harvest of love that touches the heart, comforts the soul, meets bodily needs, and lifts the spirit. It results in both the gift giver and the recipient in giving thanks to God because He's the greatest giver of all, giving us every good and perfect gift from above and for giving us that one indescribable gift that Paul writes about, Jesus Christ. Last Sunday, Fox and Corn drowned in a tragic accident at Turn Lake. The Lord gave Pastor Matt an opportunity to minister to the family. Living just right down from the lake, heard the commotion that was going on and all the sirens, went down to the lake, and almost immediately the Lord led him to the mother and the wife of the gentleman who passed away. 
It was there that for a long while he stayed with the family to comfort, to minister, and to encourage them in a desperate situation. He acted upon the opportunity that God gave because he had a seed of generosity in his spirit. And he helped his family through the most difficult moment of their lives. Well, the Lord has given this congregation an opportunity to also help and encourage this family. We're taking a special offering for the family this morning. In case you haven't heard, there's a box in front of the regular offering box that you can use this morning to give to this family. You can also give online <clears throat> by giving to uh, the uh, uh, what you see up on the screen, special offering for them um, through the church website. And there's a special place for the Quorum family that you can mark, and also the family has a GoFundMe page that's also in your bulletin. Thank you for your generosity. And thank you for planting the seeds of comfort, hope, and love as you give today. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity of sharing with others. Thank you for providing us with the means of sharing with others. We pray for your grace, comfort, and peace to be given abundantly to us all, and that we would always be thankful for your love, faithfulness, and generosity. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I am going to lead us through the prayers of the church. If you'd like to follow along, you can look on the inside of the back page of your bulletin. This morning, I'd like us to start together by saying the prayer that Jesus taught us to say. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Father, I am so incredibly glad to be with your people today. The joy does not fade, no matter how many times we gather together. In fact, it increases. Each day, as I grow in my false starts and my weaknesses, you grow my love for you. You plant seeds that you bring to fruition. You are the true God, the God of goodness and mercy and love. And although I know this from intimate encounters with your word and prayer times guided by your spirit, I also, and often more powerfully, know this from your people. I know this from preachers in small country churches in Minnesota and mega churches in California. I know this from an old man at a church in Reading placing his hands on my shoulder and lifting my small burdens before your throne. I know undeserved generosity from this church right here. And I know that your love is better than life in Brooklyn and Memphis and Houston and is taught as such in those places. You are alive and moving in your churches and among your people in this nation. As we praise you right now, so do many churches, from small home gatherings to multi-campus megachurches all across our country. I praise you for their voices lifted in song, their hands and feet hardworking in their communities, their Bibles or Bible apps open receiving your word. Thank you for the church, your church, here in America. Help it not stay where it is at, but only grow more grounded in truth, more loving of its neighbor, more steeped in generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and compassion. And Lord, we praise you for the teachers and preachers declaring your word. We praise you for their hope and faithfulness in opening their Bibles and studying you, diving deep into their relationship with you, and then guiding others to that same intimacy. We praise you for the federal government. We praise you for the hard work that happens, the people that devote their lives to serving others. We praise you for people that have a dream of better lives for so many in our nation. 
that got our heart breaks at some of their mechanisms for achieving their dreams. We are so saddened by pride and ego and greed and short-sightedness and dreams that hold no hint of you. Lord, please place your hand of peace over those who are striving without you. Help them to know you and desire you and praise you. We praise you for those that have need. We praise you because you see them and you love them and you meet them in their need. We praise you because sometimes in our hours of deepest need we see you the clearest. We praise you because you are equipping us to serve each other, to meet needs, to be love and life. Help us to be people that help and that care. Help those in need in this room, in this congregation, to speak boldly of their hurts, wounds, and needs. Help us to be people that respond open-handed, filled with emotional, mental, spiritual, and material generosity. Today, our hearts go to those that need you so deeply. Last week, the Korn family had a devastating loss of a father, a husband. Lord, we praise you that he is in your arms, that he loves you so deeply, and we mourn with his family as they grieve his loss. Help us to be people of love as we live in the reality of this tragedy. Guard our words as we speak of real people and real loss. Guide us to truth and to compassion and to your gracious love. We thank you for the Cub Scout pack and their presence in this building. We ask that as they meet here, they would grow in resourcefulness, love of adventure, and appreciation of the world you have created, and that that would drive them to you. We thank you so much for your beauty and your presence. Help us to remember your goodness. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. All right. It is time for kids to head to junior worship. So you can meet me and Marcia back by the back doors that are open, and we'll go off. Our summer sermon series, so much alliteration every summer, summer sermon series is on what does the Bible say about it? And we've been collecting... Uh, suggestions, requests from you on topics that we uh, to talk about, and we're nearing the end of the summer, which means that we're hitting all the ones that I've been putting off talking about. Because <laughs> you guys didn't pull any punches. And we've talked about some, some big topics. You know, we've talked, last week we talked about spiritual warfare, we've talked about the end times, we've talked about women in leadership, We've talked about a lot of big things, but today we're going to talk about, arguably in our culture right now, the biggest, uh, most controversial issue. Interestingly, the issue that for a lot of people is the biggest obstacle to fellowship, um, where you're the quick, you will, where we get the quickest to the point where we say that person is not a Christian for believing that, um, in both directions. Today we're going to be talking about what the Bible says about sexual identity. I'm phrasing this in a very specific way because I was surprised a little bit by the, the type of questions I got about this topic because I didn't have anybody, uh, I didn't, to my, to my knowledge, get a request from anybody saying, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? Or what does the Bible say about transgenderism? Or uh, what I got was questions about how do I treat this person or how do I deal with this issue is very much about living in this issue. It wasn't about what does the Bible say about right or wrong. It was about how do we navigate this because uh, this is a, an issue that is, is personal for a lot of us in our own immediate families or in our own lives and or it's personal in how you uh, cons are concerned about the world your children are being raised in, your grandchildren. Like for all of us, we get very, very... Um, touched by this issue. It's, it's an important one. And we're concerned about how to live with each other and how to live through this. And I think that a big part of the problem in, in the way we talk about this is that we are, we don't, we, we're not translating the Bible into the way we talk today. There's a big disconnect between the way the Bible talks uh, about humanity and who we are and what we are and the way our modern culture does. And this sermon series is partly meant to teach us about the specific issue we're discussing, but it's also meant to teach us about how we read Scripture and determine what the Bible says. And so whenever we are talking about a subject that is, anytime it's, it's especially controversial, but also it's something that we talk about a lot and is very modern, we have to make sure that we are 
translating our ideas properly when we connect the Bible and and our uh, modern way of talking about things. And so I think a lot of the reason why people get so uh, hurt in the way we talk about this on both sides is that failure, a failure in translation. So that's why rather than talking about what does the Bible say about homosexuality or transgenderism or any of those uh, topics, we're talking about what does the Bible say about our identity as humans and how that identity is determined because I believe that is a major point of disconnect in this topic. So let's start by, by digging deeper into this question behind the question, what, what, what I'm talking about here. Modern culture defines human identity by our desires, and especially our sexual desires. Basically, you are what you want. This has become a very important way of defining a human being's identity, and this is a very recent idea. It has only been in the last century or so that we have defined people by what they want. We have said that you are, like, basically, um, gender or uh, sexual orientation is a very modern invention. To say this person is a heterosexual, this person is a homosexual, and that, that thing defines them. And this is not something that one side or the other does. This is what we do in the modern culture. We define ourselves so much by what we want, by our desires. It's just all of us tend to think in this way. And so much so that our legal system will categorize people by their desires the same way they categorize them uh, in terms of race or others or nationality or other things that, that define us. So that a sexual orientations, like certain sexual orientations are recognized as a minority, the same way a, a race would be recognized as a minority. It defines you on the same level that your genetic makeup does. And in fact, in some instances, our, we would say that it defines you more than your genetic makeup does. Because when it comes to your gender, we will say that what you want to be is more important than, like when, when, what, you are, when what you are genetically conflicts with what you want, we will go with what you want to be. And so we define people by their desires. And this is a very modern perspective. I'm not saying, because I don't know where, I'm not going to assume where anybody's coming to this topic from. I don't want to make any assumptions because what I'm hoping to do is it gets to a place where we can talk about this and really understand what Scripture says without um, unnecessary offense. Okay, so I don't know where you're coming to from this, but this is, regardless, this is a new way of thinking about humanity. And that means that it is not a perspective that you will find in Scripture because the, the Bible was written a little more than 100 years ago. It was actually written between 2,000 and 5,000 years ago. It's a pretty wide range, right? And so any, any perspective that we have invented in the last 100 years will not be present in the Bible. And so the problem that we run into is we bring this way of... We assume that the Bible is speaking in this way, and so we import this modern way of thinking about people that they're defined by their desires, and we, we take the, what the Bible says and put it in those categories, and this is where a lot of people get confused and get really hurt. Because what happens is you go into Scripture and you find that the Bible categorizes certain sexual behaviors as sinful. Certain sexual behaviors are categorized as sinful in Scripture. Now, you will find, actually, I was interesting, when I Googled this, um, the first page was all about, uh, there's only one result in the, on the first page of Google that said that the Bible uh, categorizes these things as sinful, every other page was arguing the opposite because that's a movement that's trying to build momentum. Um, we're not going to get into that. Uh, I can tell you that it's not how the Bible has been interpreted before 100 years, you know, the last 100 years, and it's not how the first generations of the church interpreted it because, um, because things like homosexuality were more prevalent in the culture that the church started in than they are even today. And the influence of the church changed that. So clearly the first generations of the church believed that the Bible categorized these sexual behaviors as sinful. But here's the thing that happens now in our way of thinking. That if those behaviors are categorized as sinful, then we jump to the desire for those things is sinful. And, and if I'm defined by my desires, if my identity comes from my desires, then all of a sudden now my identity is sinful. It's not just that I did a sinful, sinful thing or that I want a sinful thing, but now I am a sinful thing. Because we categorize, I am a person who wants these things, that defines me. If those things are wrong, 
then I am wrong. And so what happens is it seems, and when we import our ideas into the Bible, that the Bible condemns whole identities. Not just a behavior, not even a desire, but a person is now condemned in their existence. And you're basically saying you are sinful and there's nothing really you can do to change it. As long as you feel this way, you are a sinful person in who you are, in your identity. And as we bring our modern categories into the Bible, that is what we get boxed into saying. And Christians have reacted to this in two different ways. Some people will say that the, God would not condemn people's whole identities. That's not the message that we find in Scripture. That's not how pe- Jesus treats people. So that can't possibly be correct. That God would just condemn whole people. And I, I get that. And actually, I, would, I, I feel that same way. To say God wouldn't just say, you are an irredeemable person. Because of this thing about you, you as a person are are garbage. You as a person are worthless. I don't believe that God says that, and I don't find anything in Scripture that would support treating a person that way. So some people have then said, well, that can't be, so then it must not be condemned in Scripture. And then we start treating those passages, uh, you know, we start to minimize those passages or explain them away. And on the other side, people say, well, but the Bible says that these things are wrong. Therefore, this, all this other logic that we've got tied up in this must be correct, too. And so we end up condemning people and, and saying things in ways that are deeply hurtful because we feel boxed into it. Because we want to be faithful to what the Bible teaches us about right and wrong. And so we're trying to stick to that. And we damage a lot of people in this miscommunication. And so we have these two these two sides, these two ways of responding, and what we're ultimately struggling over, the, the issue that has been, been brought up by all this is, does God really condemn whole identities as sinful? Does God really say, this person, not what they've done, but this person is uniquely sinful in ways that other people are not, who they are? Does God actually say that? Does Scripture actually say that? So this is really a conversation, not even necessarily about sexuality, but about identity. Where does our identity come from, and how does God see our identity? Now, what we, we've talked about, where does this idea that we're defined by our desires come from? Well, I would say it comes from two different places. For those outside the church, it comes from, for people who don't believe in God, it's really the only thing left. When you want to talk about what is the purpose of a human being, if, if they, their existence is random, they came in with no purpose, then what else is there except to satisfy your desires? Right? That's something we, a perspective we see talked about in Ecclesiastes. Like if, if you're not thinking about, if there's nothing before us and nothing after us, there's just this life, then just eat, drink, and be merry. You know, it's just all there is is what we enjoy. Now, on the other hand, there's also been a movement in the church to say that human beings are uh, defined by what, by what fulfills them. There's a very influential document in church history called the Westminster Catechism, which says the chief end of man, the purpose of humanity, is to... Um, oh, no! I'm <laughs> blanked. No, to, uh, to... Oh, man, that's the plan. To... Um, I can't believe I'm blanking on the Westminster... Worship God and enjoy Him forever. There we go. The chief end of man, the purpose of humanity, I apologize. Uh, The chief purpose of man is to worship God and glorify Him forever, enjoy Him forever. Okay, so, that that we are um, meant to, like, that's, we find personal fulfillment, and that's what we're for. You know, that's how we know we're moving in the right direction. So, both within Christianity and with outside Christianity, we've, we've often said that our compass is our fulfillment. The problem is that that's not how the Bible talks about humanity and humanity's identity, humanity's purpose. In the Bible, humanity was created for a function outside of ourselves. We were created for a purpose with a job to do. Here's what it says in Genesis 1, when human beings are created, which would be the logical place to look, right? Jesus, or God says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. 
God made us with a purpose, and that purpose is tied up in this idea of being made in the image of God. And there are two ways that people read the, the image of God, and it both mean, they both end up the same place. One, to bear the image of God, is to be like God in important ways. So we say that human beings are different from animals because we are not just flesh, but we are also spirit. Right, so we have bodies, we are material creatures, but we also have an ability to be more than that. We have an ability to interact with God and to choose God and to follow. And we, we have these, these, we're somewhere in between an animal and God because we are flesh and spirit. Now, the, other th- the other way that we read the image of God is that the image of God is a vocation, it's a job, because if you bear the image of a king in the ancient world, then you are that king's ambassador. You rule on that king's behalf. Or you, you exercise their authority. And so human beings are meant to be God's middle management on earth. Right? That we, we, rule, oh, we, we lead creation because we have the capacity to choose God back. Animals don't have the capacity to choose. They just do what they're built to do. But human beings have the capacity to, to communicate basically between God and creation and to rule the world on his behalf. And both of these realities point to the same thing, that we have a purpose, and that purpose is built into who we are. Scripture, in Scripture, our identities come from God. And He made us to be His representatives on earth. So the most fundamental truth about your identity is God made you for a purpose, and that purpose is to be His representatives on earth. I think an important way we should say He made us it's not that we each individually are like competing representatives of God, but as humanity, this is our mission. We were made with a function. And that's what defines it. It's kind of like, what's the difference between a, hammer and a, or a, a stick and a rock and a hammer? Right? A hammer has been, is a, you know, I guess it's a piece of metal and a stick put together for a particular function, and that's what makes it a hammer. You have the same objects not put together for that purpose, and it wouldn't be a hammer, Right? Like, if I just duct tape the head of a hammer to the side of the stick, it's not a hammer. Hammerness comes from the function. That's, that's what gives us our identity. Okay, so if our identity comes from function, then we have to deal with where our, our desires come from. Because that's, we would say our identity comes from our desires. So where do, where do our identities come from? What ends up happening in this debate is we end up with two possible solutions, depending on how we, how we uh, think about it. On the one hand, people will say, well, my desires, I was born with them. They came from God. God would not make me with an especially sinful uh, identity. Therefore, it must not be wrong. I was born this way, and so it must not be sinful because it came from God. Now, on the other hand, as people have, have to justify how God could condemn whole identities, they would say, well, no, you must have chosen that identity. You are that way because you chose to be. You have those desires because you cho- made choices that brought them about. I do believe that, there are, that our, our choices affect our, our desires and our minds and our hearts more than we realize. But the Bible doesn't actually take either of these explanations for where our desires come from. And I'll, I'll give you a test case how we can tell this isn't true, okay? And then I'll give you the verse that flat out says it. But first, let's look at the very first sin, okay? So, Adam and Eve are in the garden. Uh, God says, don't eat from this tree. And Eve goes over and she talks to a snake. And remember last week, we talked, it's, it's a snake. It's not Satan. It's, a, it's definitely a snake. Probably not Satan. And, which means it's one of the creatures that she is tasked with ruling over, right? And she talks to the snake and the snake starts to influence her instead. And tells her, hey, you should eat from that, that tree. And it says, When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. So Eve was acting on desires that she already had. And the question is, where do those desires come from? Well, in some sense, they do come from God. But did God give her the desire to eat that particular piece of fruit at that particular moment? Did he give her a desire she couldn't resist to, to eat? And he couldn't have because then that's his, he's responsible for that sin, right? If he gave her a compelling desire that she couldn't resist to eat that fruit, it could, then that would be his fault that she ate it, right? So that doesn't make sense. But on the other hand, we can't say that those desires came from sinful decisions that she had made in the past because no sinful decisions have been made yet. 
So somehow she already has these desires that, that led her to sin in this way, even though no sins have happened yet. Well, where do those desires come from? Well, according to Scripture, our desires don't come directly from God or from our choices. They come from our flesh. Because remember, as, as God's image, we are physical beings that have the capacity to choose God, to choose to obey God or not to. We have the capacity to decide to do what our desires compel us to do or decide not to. And that is a fundamental, that is a key thing about who we are and what we're called to do. John says it this way in First John. He says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. Now, John is using some pretty extreme uh, terminology here because he wants to be very clear. What I don't want you to hear from this is all desires that we have are wrong. Because there have been Christian movements that have said any physical desires are, are horrible and need to be absolutely destroyed. And that's where we got um, you know, hermits and monks and, and all these really extreme movements. And that's not really what Scripture is saying. God made us with desires and, and, and intentionally. But what we have to recognize is that our desires come from the fact that we are physical beings. Your physical body is going to have desires. That's how they function. We have hunger because we need food, right? We have these desires. And our, our bodies are also subject to all the, all the things that can affect the material world. And so we end up with different desires and different things in our flesh, different, um, yeah, just, we just have different desires from person to person. But they, they're in our flesh. They're part of being embodied people. And ultimately, our calling as human beings is to be uh, flesh creatures filled with the Spirit of God who can choose to obey God. Right? This is why when, when Adam was put in the garden, this is what happens. It says, The Lord God put the man, took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Why did God have to tell Adam not to eat from that tree? Because if he hadn't, eventually Adam would have eaten from it. It was a good-looking tree. The fruit was delicious. It, it looked really good. So if he hadn't been told not to, he wouldn't have thought anything of it. He would have just been hungry one day and grabbed one and eaten it. And so God is telling him not to do this because he knows Adam has a natural desire to do it. Which means that Adam also has the ability to decide not to do it. And that's part of his calling as God's, as, as God's representative is to, to direct his actions according to God's plan, to be more than just a material creature. So we have the ability to choose whether to control our desires or be controlled by them. And those are the options, to control our desires or be controlled by them. Now you may think, well, that's because this was before the fall. Adam had that ability, but we're all fallen, so we don't have that ability. Except that the very next generation... You have the story of Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve's children, okay? And there's this whole rivalry thing between Cain and Abel, and uh, Cain is really upset. And this is what God says to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Cain has a choice to make. He can do what his desires are pushing him to do because he is angry, he is resentful, he is envious, and he wants to be violent towards his brother. He would find it very satisfying to be violent towards his brother. And God says, you have a choice. Sin wants to control you, but you need to control it. This is what being a human being means. This is what makes us different from the rest of creation is that we can make this choice. And it's really important for us to understand what the Bible tells us about the consequences of this choice. Because what the world is telling us now, what we are telling each other, this is inside the church as well as outside the church, and in every branch of the church, what we, on some level, what we tell each other is that you will find your best self when you are most satisfied, when you can satisfy your desires, when you express yourself. There's so much language about authenticity and how you need to figure out what you really want and go for it. And when you finally embrace who you deep down really are, that's when you'll be fulfilled. And this is not Scripture's perspective. 
Because in Scripture, when we let our desires rule over us, what happens is our identities and our relationships get distorted. From the very beginning, what we find is when we let ourselves be controlled by our desires, our relationships and our identities get distorted. Look at what happens after they eat from the tree. He took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Immediately, their relationships with each other are affected. They recognize their vulnerability, and they don't like being vulnerable with each other. Their relationship has been affected with each other. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Their relationship with God has been affected. Now they're afraid of him. Before they were never afraid of him, but now there is fear in that relationship. The Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Now we're playing the blame game. This is not a good excuse, right? This is not a good excuse. Just because she handed the fruit. Adam was there the whole time. And he just went along with it. But he's happy to play the blame game. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. She's doing the same thing, passing the buck. Because, and you see how immediately these relationships are poisoned and, and fractured and their identities are damaged because they, they, just un, they, they pursued their desires at the expense of the commands of God. This is a, a big disconnect between the biblical perspective and the modern perspective. Where we have here, Here's how I'm going to put it. We have confused heaven and hell. You would think that would be a hard thing to mix up. But we have confused heaven and hell. And here's what I mean. The way we popularly conceive heaven is often you'll hear people talk about it as you're going to go to a place that is perfect, and perfect means you get to do whatever you want. All of your appetites are satisfied. You will get to go to your favorite spots and do your favorite things and eat your favorite foods and see all your favorite people. And we talk about it as eternal wish fulfillment. There are religions that, that promise eternal wish fulfillment in eternity. And do you know what Christianity and Scripture calls eternal wish fulfillment? We call that hell. We would call that hell. To have every desire in you satisfied all the time, that is hell, because desires consume you. That ultimately leads to hell, because notice that satisfying desires, it brought hell into paradise. Satisfying desires at the expense of the commands of God. Because remember, please, don't, this is difficult to navigate without making you think that feeling good is bad. That's not what I'm trying to say, because there was so much good in the garden. So many desires to be fulfilled in the garden in the proper way. It's when we take my desires and put them over God's commands, that's when we get into trouble. So please hear that distinction. And this is how Paul would describe uh, this state that we are talking about here, this, this hellish state, because we often think that I'm, you can't, you're not free until you can do anything you want. In the Bible, that's not freedom. Here's what Paul says. I don't understand what I do. I don't do what I want to do. Instead, I do what I hate to do. I do what I don't want to do. I am no longer the one who does these things. It is sin living in me that does them. He says, what I find is I know what I'm supposed to do, but I keep messing it up. Like, in the short term, I might do what gives me immediate pleasure, but my long-term goal, like, I, I didn't want to hurt that person, but I did. I didn't want to break that relationship, but I did. I didn't want to become that kind of person, but I did. And it's almost like there's this other power living in me, compelling me to do these things. It is sin living in me that does them. I know that there is nothing good in my sinful nature. I want to do what is good, but I can't. I don't do the good things I want to do. I keep on doing the evil things I don't want to do. I do what I don't want to do. But I am not really the one doing it. It's sin living in me. He's not trying to pass the buck, but he's trying to say what happens is you end up controlled, dominated by this power. As you feed your, your desire, as you, as you make that, it controls you. 
Because when I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Deep inside me, I find joy in God's love, in God's law. But I see another law working in the parts of my body. It fights against the law of my mind. It makes me a prisoner of the law of sin. That law controls the parts of my body. What a terrible failure I am. Who will save me from this sin that brings death to my body? So in my mind, I am a slave to God's law. But in my sinful nature, I am a slave to the law of sin. Can anyone relate to that? That frustration. Why did I do that again? I said I wasn't going to do that anymore. I said I wasn't going to react that way anymore. I had 12 months to get ready for another Christmas with that family member, and I did it again. Right? We can all relate to this, this way that we get dominated, we get controlled, and we can't get out of it. Does that feel free? It's not just that you can do whatever you want, but you have to do whatever you want. You have to do what your desires compel you to do. And our desire, I don't think anybody would say their desires are always right. In fact, this was so clear in the ancient world that this isn't even just a biblical perspective. You can get this from reading ancient Greek philosophers. Plato would define freedom the same way. That to be controlled, be able to do whatever you want and only ever do whatever, you, whatever your desires say is not freedom, it's slavery. Free, even for Plato, freedom was being able to choose what you were going to do based on what is right not just on what your appetites want at the time. That's freedom in the ancient world, and we've twisted it around. So as we're trying to figure out what does it mean to be the most authentic me, a world is telling us it's when you are able to satisfy all your desires freely without any inhibition from anyone else. But what Scripture tells us is that we are our most authentic selves when we are able to choose what is right regardless of our desires. That's when we are our most authentic selves, when we are what God was created, what what God created us to be, when we are more than simply flesh, when we are the image of God. Is when we are able to choose what is right. That's what I'm supposed to be. That's what you're supposed to be. Not a slave to your passions, but the image of God. And so when we read what Scripture is telling us, we have to recalibrate our understanding of these categories and understanding of what the Bible is saying and how the, what the Bible says we are. Because ultimately, when we understand our identities this way, it opens up the hope that Scripture gives us. Because Paul, as he's going into this dark tunnel in, in chapter 7, He comes up in chapter 8 with this glorious realization, this glorious joy. He says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. There is freedom that Jesus Christ offers us. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, you know, God told us to do right, but we're still fleshly people, and so just telling us what to do didn't give us the power to do it. God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In Christ, we have hope to be something different, to be something more, to be restored to what we were always meant to be. Through Jesus Christ, our identities and relationships can be restored. We can be the people who can choose to follow God in whatever He asks of us. You know, the most, if if we define human, not in terms of what we've fallen into, but what we were made to be, the most human moment, the most glorious human moment, I would argue, is in another garden. Not the Garden of Eden, but the Garden of Gethsemane. In a moment when Jesus had conflicting desires. Jesus did not want to go to the cross. His, his flesh did not want to go to the cross. And he prays, not my will, but yours be done. That is the most human moment in the best possible way. And what human beings are called to be is that, that choice, not my will, but yours be done. Yours be done. And it's interesting comparing that to his three disciples who are just a little ways away and can't even decide to stay awake when Jesus asks them to. And that's when he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
Jesus is winning this glorious victory in the garden while there they can't even stay awake. But he won that victory for all of us to open this hope for all of us. And this is the, what, the instruction that Paul gives us in Colossians 3. He says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. So he says, make the decision to not give in to these desires that used to control you. Put them to death. And he does, in this first passage, tend to focus on sexual immorality. Here's the thing. For certain segments of the church, you know, for our, our kind of side of the spectrum, we're really good at calling these out. We're really good at calling this part out. But Paul is not done. Now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other. All of these are also ways that we give into desires that disrupt our reflection of the image of God. Like these are also things that get us off base, also things that we have to fight. And it's really easy for us to look at people and say, well, those people struggle with this, but I don't, because I don't struggle from that temptation. But we all have something, right? And what he's saying is that that anger, that rage that you have, that keeps you from reflecting the image of God. The malice, the way you scheme against other people, that, makes you, that keeps you from the image of God. The slander, the way you lie more easily about the people you disagree with. The fact that you will go, you're quicker to share posts on social media that criticize people you don't like than you are to share the ones that maybe praise them or criticize the people you do like. All of these are things, ways that we give in to our desires that keep us from reflecting the image of God. All of these need to be put away. And so unfortunately, sometimes we treat this like it's a minority issue. This is a humanity issue. And every one of us has these desires that need to be confronted and controlled. But notice what, where Paul goes on. This is, you've heard me use this passage so many times, but it is my favorite passage of Scripture. He says, Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the image of its Creator. When you became a Christian, you took on a new identity in Christ. Here, in that image, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. All of the boxes that our world puts us in, all of the identities that are put on us are taken away and are overruled by our identity in Christ. When you give yourself to Christ, you are a new creation, you are a new identity, and that is what matters. That is also true of your brothers and sisters. They also have taken on that same identity in Christ. And this is the hope that we have, that that new identity can overwrite everything that we struggle with, everything that, that pins us down, everything, everything that controls us, and you can be something new. So let me, let me find a place to land here. I've got three, three things that I want uh, us to land on in our conclusion. First of all, God does not define people by their desires, nor does he condemn people for them. Now let me explain this, what, exactly what I mean. God does not define people by their desires. There are no words like homosexual um, in the Old Testament or in Scripture. The words that are used are the words for behavior, for actions. Because all human beings, being fleshly creatures, have appetites, have desires that need to be controlled. You know that, that every single human being has to control their sexual appetites, regardless of what they're for, in order to re reflect the image of God well? Every single one of us does. And so, God doesn't define you as you are, like, He doesn't define you as you are the person who wants these things and that's all you are. He also doesn't condemn us for having this, simply for having desires that are contrary to his will. Jesus had at least one desire that was contrary to the will of God. But Jesus was defined by his decision not to follow that desire, but to follow Jesus. And so God doesn't condemn a person because their flesh desires something. What God cares about is what we do with that, because that's what makes us human is what we do with the desires that we have. And every single human being has desires that must be controlled in order to bear God's image well. Every one of us. 
That means we ought to have compassion for every other person who's struggling with the same thing as us. Because we are all in that boat. The desires we have are different, but the battle is the same. And so we should never look at those people and say, well, those people are the really bad ones. Because theirs is more obvious, or visible, or socially unacceptable. We all struggle. And the church is meant to be a place that can reach all people who struggle, who are in that struggle, to follow Jesus. And to, con- to control their desires to, to give themselves over to Jesus. And finally, what we need to hear is that in Christ, we can rediscover, in Christ alone, we can rediscover our true identities as God's loved and chosen people. The only hope that there is to be what you were made to be is through Christ. Because you won't find it by going deeper into yourself. What You will find it in Christ. Because in Christ, we find that freedom to, to be able to obey God, to be what we were created to be. Amen? I'm going to ask the worship team to come up, and I'm going to ask you um, if you're ready to take a next step. At the end of each service, we invite people to take a next step because there are, uh, every time you hear the Word of God, there is an opportunity to respond. So the first step that you can take is to give your life to Jesus. If you haven't chosen to follow Him, and if you haven't sought out the freedom that Jesus can give us, Today is the best day to find that freedom. If you find yourself feeling like what Paul described, being trapped in behavior that you know you're not supposed to be in, today is the best day to find freedom in Jesus. If you're looking for a congregation to be a part of and you want to know more about this church, you want to know more about what it looks like to participate, to get baptized, any of those kind of decisions, we encourage you to sign up for a Connect class. Our next Connect class is September 5th from 1230 to 2. We have one of those each month. It's offered. You need to find out who we are, what we do, and how you can be a part of it. I also encourage you, you can check on your connection card if you'd like to join a small group, because as we come together and we live life together, we give each other strength and we help each other navigate the challenges that it is to be human and to obey God. And finally, God calls us to give back, to serve others. And so if you're in a place where you're ready to serve God's people, you're ready to serve the world, then you can check that box uh, to join a service team. And those connection cards, you can put them in the receptacles in the back, or you can leave them on your seat as you go. So I encourage you to consider making one of those decisions. If today's the day you're going to give your life to Christ, you can come forward. You can During the song, you can talk to one of the staff members after. But I encourage you to consider what God's calling you to do as we stand and sing our final song. benediction comes from the book of Jude. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Dear Father, we thank you for the glorious calling you put on us to be more than our flesh, to be more than a creature, but to be your children, to be your image, to govern this world according to your will. Father, we pray that you would give us the strength to do your will. 
Give us the strength to face down whatever desires may be tempting us away from you. Give us compassion for our brothers and sisters who are also fighting that same battle. Help us to recognize the beams in our eyes as we look at the specks in each other's eyes. Father, we pray that you would give us opportunities and wisdom to speak truth into our world. To let this world know what it means and what it looks like to follow you. Most of all, Father, we wish we wish to introduce our friends and our family and our community to you. To your love, to your forgiveness, to your plan for our lives. So we pray that you would fill us with your spirit and strengthen us to accomplish that task. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are, uh, after, right after the service, we have a, our pounding for Rachel, in which we're going to bless her with some gifts to set her up in her new apartment. So if you would like to hang out and, and participate in that and get a piece of cake, uh, as soon as we're done here, you just head over to the fellowship hall. Stay healthy, stay hopeful, and go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.